morning. Good to have everyone here this morning. Glad you're here with us. And uh, one thing I figured out about 10 o'clock service is it starts out pretty light, but by the end of the music, I look out there and there's, there's lots of faces. So we're glad you're here. Those that are listening in on Facebook, uh, we're glad you're here as well, being a part of our service. So after the service today, um, when I'm not on camera, we're going to have a quick, quick discussion about Sunday school. I've had several people tell me already. Um, those of you that's enjoying it, the stay in, sleep in a little bit late, uh, you, can, you can voice your opinion too. So we'll, we'll hear everybody. But uh, we just need to talk about that. We're, we're getting close to that time where we can do that. Our county is is doing better rather than orange, and so uh, we actually are getting to have uh, spectators at outdoor sports. We started on Thursday night, and so we're really excited about that for our schools. And so as things begin to open up, uh, we can start going back to how we, we've done things for many, many years. But let's go ahead and stand up together this morning. Let's start with the word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that we come to worship you today. Lord, I just pray that whatever we're, we're dealing with, that we would just lay it down and let you have it. Lord, I pray that we allow your spirit to move in this place this morning and that this service is about you and not us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
just sing praises to your name, Lord, and celebrate how great thou art, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be with those who might not be here today, Lord, that are sick or ailing or, or whatever, traveling or whatever, Lord. We pray that you be with them. Be with each one here. Just let us look to you for strength. Look to you for wisdom and guidance, Lord, in our own lives that we might be able to do more and, and bring others into the church and, and win the souls to you, Lord. Just give us that strength. Just be at the offering today, Lord. We ask you to let us be strong, whether they can give or not, Lord, and, and let us go forth. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we bring our tithes to God.
take terrible things and turn them in for good. Lord, we pray this morning that we would just listen to your word. Lord, that we would allow it to seep deep within us, Lord, and that we would listen. Lord, that we would allow you to, to lead us. And Lord, lead us past just the service, but through the week in a way that we would give glory and honor to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's for sure. I forgot. Ernie said something about it, and Ray just said something about it. Next week's time change. Hey, Ava and Alora. Okay. We're in Galatians this morning. Chapter 5. I know probably wondering how long we're being in Galatians, and uh, I couldn't tell you, but that's where we are right now. As I look at this morning's sermon, we're 44 weeks into this series, we probably missed another five or six. Um, we're almost right at the point where last year we had to shut down. We're getting close. I started the series... When all the push on COVID and things begin to happen, and many of us believed what we were told, that we were going to have about a two-week reset and kind of get everybody fixed up and then go back to normal. And almost a year later, nothing is normal at all. This week, I've, as I was telling the girls, I've really had to take in my my news very slowly and in little bitty pieces because all of it makes me mad. Our Congress has passed some things that are going to basically allow anybody to vote who wants to. Uh, things that are just going to begin to take our freedoms away. There's going to be things in there that... Uh, Christians will be excluded from. And people have said for over a year now that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but everything I've said has happened. And I'm not a prophet. It's not like I want it to happen. But what I'm saying is we could see what's happening. There's a journal that I read every once in a while that is uh, it's kind of a newspaper, but it's written by five men who used to write in communist China. And they had to sneak out of that country because you couldn't write what you wanted to write. And now they're here and they're saying that it's just following the same thing. Well, you know, in China, people are being killed for being Christians. In China, people can't have Bibles. In China, people are having to go underground to worship God. Knowing that if they get caught that their families will be hurt, they will lose their job. And everything will become really tough for them. The wonderful thing about that story is, is those people in China are stronger now. The Christian church is stronger in China now than it has ever been. I wonder why. It's because they went through it, haven't they? And if you didn't really believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you would not sacrifice all of those things, including your life, for him. But I believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth, became a man, so he could be one of us. And he never sinned. And he became the sin of the world on the cross. And on the third day, he arose physically from the grave, from the dead. 
I believe that with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. That's why I can continue on. This morning, the sermon's about running a good race. How we can keep our freedom as we run a good race. Now, most of my stories are about swimming, not running. My dad coached track a long time. I ran track. When you're tall and skinny, they make you run all the really long races, the ones that really are terrible. I wanted to run the short races, not the long ones. And I ran hurdles one time in practice and uh, put my face on the, on, the, on the track, and I never did that again. And so I know about running. I actually know a little bit more about swimming. But both of them are racing. Have you ever thought about your life as running a race? For those of you that like sports activities, athletic events, you could really turn this into being like baseball or whatever you would want to pick. But we see the importance of how athletes, how they train, how they do things. And how they train in the right things. Several years ago, there was a family that came to our church, and their son swam for me on the high school swim team. He was pretty good. He was a pretty good swimmer. Not the fastest I'd ever had, but he was fast. And he decided towards the end of his senior year that he wanted to do triathlons. If you don't know what that is, triathlon is a one-mile swim. It's a 25-mile bike ride, and it ends with a six-mile six run. Now, this is for the benefit of two people in the room that know the exact things about triathlon because they were at the Olympic Training Center and lived there. It is actually 1.5 kilometers swim, 40-kilometer bike ride, and a 10-kilometer run. And that's only for Theron and Paula because they know what the actual race is. So this young man wanted to do this, and so he practiced running all over town. There's a lot of open space to run, right? And then he would ride his bike all over the county. But he would practice swimming in a pool. Now, to me and you, I didn't think anything about it. I thought if you can swim up and down them lanes, you can swim in a, in a body of water, a lake or a pond or whatever it may be. And so I thought, no problem. No problem. He'll be able to do this. He came back on Monday to swim practice. He had a cut on his face. His jaw was bruised. He had scratches all over his arms. And I said, how did it go? And he said, I don't want to talk to you about it. I said, what happened? He said, well, you know how the, the swim's the first thing, and I really thought swimming was going to get me in the lead. He said, I almost drowned. He said, we didn't think about the fact that everybody's swimming in this big clump with the water moving around with the wind. He said, I didn't have no lane ropes, and people were ducking my head under water and elbowing me and punching me and scratching me and pulling my feet. And he said, I almost drowned. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't swim like that in, in a triathlon and have a chance of not getting killed. <laughs> So I started calling people that knew about it and checking into it. And I learned a new way to swim it. And we'd swim, and Theron knows how it is, but you keep one arm as your punching arm, and you lift your head up really high to get a breath. So if the, the waves are coming over, you can get a breath of, of, of air and not suck in water. And it's very defensive. I never knew swimming could be defensive, but it can be defensive. You learn how to do certain kinds of kicks, and the goal is to keep people away from you. 
Now, if you can defend yourself in the water, what we learned is everybody will, will stay away from you because they don't want to get near you. They're just taking out the ones that can't do it. And all of a sudden, he started placing very high because he would get out of the water first to start his bike ride, so he always had a lead. And people, people go, how did you do so well the second time from the first time? He said, I had to retrain for a new event. I had to change how I swam. Yeah, I'm a great swimmer with lanes, but I realized you can't swim the same way in this lane as you do in a lake. I really thought about that. I felt bad at first for telling him, you know, if you got to punch someone, punch them. But people were always trying to cut into him. They would try to swim in front of him, kick him in the head. Running the race as a Christian is the same way. There's always someone that wants to take you out of the race. There's always someone that wants to make you want to quit the race. My dad would get so mad when he was coaching track, and he'd just have a kid all of a sudden just fall in the middle of the, the field and quit. I ran when I was, you know, sixth grade and junior high and all that. I ran track. And my dad said, you might become, be in last place, but if you ever stop and just sit down, we're going to have a bad day. When I was coaching swimming, it's the same thing. I've had kids keep swimming after they hit their head on the wall, and the, we tried to stop them. They kept swimming. Why? Because Coach Drake was not going to put up with quitters. I had a guy one time swim, got out at the other end, the opposite end, and he could see my veins popped out all the way across that 25-yard pool. I didn't want quitters. But sometimes in life when we're running the race, it is so difficult that you just want to sit down and take a break, don't you? I know I do. You just want to stop and go, okay, I need a break from this. Let's do something different. The problem is many of us run this race like it's a sprint. And it's a, it's a marathon. You've got to keep going. If you talk to marathon runners, they will all tell you. And, and you can ask Darren, he knew, knows the best marathon runners in the world. They will tell you that there is always a certain point in the race for them that it's like they just hit a brick wall, and if they could just stop and take a break, they would really want to. But they know in order to win the race, they got to push through that, that mile or that half mile or whatever it is. It always gives them trouble. The crazy thing to me about it is you're talking about people that run hundreds of miles a week. Just training. And even with that, there's always, whether it's mile 50 or mile 30 or whatever it is, there's a certain point to where they hit a wall. When I was coaching high school and I coached the club team, I had from little bitty kids up to old people or older people. And I decided, now I didn't swim, by the way, just so you know, but I decided that we were going to swim the long distance challenge. It was a USA swimming thing. And the younger kids swam like a half a mile. The next group swam a mile. Then uh, I think I think Theron's group swam two miles. And then and then the old people like Karen swam a 3k or oh, a 5k that's right. 5,000 kilometers. Now, the rule, swimming this in a pool that's four foot six, do you know how tempting it is to put your feet on the bottom, especially 
There were times as she sw was swimming, all of a sudden she would float to her back. You could see the muscle cramps in her leg, and she's just going, oh, this is awful. Now, partly because there weren't many people that competed in it, but she actually had the fastest time in the country. But I know there was times in that that she just, this is stupid. <laughs> I'm a grown woman. Why would I do this to myself? And I had little bitty kids swimming miles. I mean, you could just, they would just float up like a dead fish. And then they just, here they go. And I just tell them, keep going, just keep going. They were allowed to drink water, so I'd throw a water bottle at them, and they float on their back and drink water. You know, I had every single kid out of like 35 people, every one of them finished. I was so proud. I was so proud because I know if it had been me, I'd have been the one guy that would have quit. I guarantee it. I couldn't even float on my back that long. And so the Christian race is the same way. You're going to fall down sometimes. You ever seen those runners that are running really fast to get to the finish line and they trip and, and fall before they get to the finish line? What a terrible, terrible feeling that's got to be. This morning, I want us to see in our text that we need to run a good race. In Galatians 5, verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You might think, we've been talking about this thing every week, and we have. Because that's what the book of Galatians, the letter of Galatians, is about. The first thing I want you to see is hold on to your freedom. Hold on to your freedom. Now, many of us, myself included, feel like we are losing our freedom as a country, as people in the United States. But I want to tell you this morning, and everyone that's listening, hear this plainly. Your freedom does not come from a place. Your freedom comes from a person who is Jesus Christ. Amen? Your freedom doesn't come from being in the United States or China or Russia or wherever you live to, and you're listening. Your freedom comes through a person. And that freedom may not look like you're free on the outside, but your freedom is inside through the Holy Spirit of God. Do not lose track of that fact. It's really interesting to me how many middle school aged, even upper grades and elementary school, know about politics. I think they, they hear things from their parents, but they also see things and now that school's back going, I guarantee you they hear things from teachers and they hear things from other students. It is interesting to me how they come to me and they go, hey, I heard this. Is that right or wrong? And I'll go, and then they'll stop me and I go, is it right or wrong from the Bible? You know, that blesses my heart that kids want to know what's right and wrong from the Bible. They don't want to know my opinion or what, what I would teach someone at school or something like that. They want to know what God says about that. And God says your freedom comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.2 Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The second thing you need to hold on to 
as you run this, this race is hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. It is by grace, right, that you are saved. It's through faith and through God's grace and mercy that you can be saved. It's not through works. It's not through anything that you would want to add to Christianity. It is amazing to me how many churches and denominations have Jesus plus something, whether it's baptism or um, speaking in tongues or whatever it is. They, they say it's Jesus plus this act. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be baptized. I'm not saying that speaking in tongues isn't a spiritual gift. I'm not saying those things. What I'm saying is it's not Jesus plus doing things. It's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Amen? Amen. Jesus doesn't need anybody's help. If you think God needs your help to save people, you need to start over right now. Because you ain't running the race. You're sitting over in the mud pile somewhere over on the side as everybody else runs the race. Because God doesn't need your actions for you to be saved. If that was the case, he wouldn't have had to send Jesus to live on this earth and to die for us. Do not forget that. We so often act like God owes us a cookie or something because we are serving him and we're doing good. You know, this country doesn't need a revival. Uh-oh. Now you're going, what? This dude has lost it finally, completely. This country does not need a revival. What this country needs is repentance. And this country needs just to serve God like the Bible says. We don't need a special service. We don't need a special singer or a special preacher. What we need is people to get their hearts right with God. We don't need anything extra. You say, well, you know, we used to have these big services. Yes, you did. And there's nothing wrong with that. But let me tell you, when we try to box in, quote, revival for two weeks a year, there's a problem because we should be serving God every single day and moment of our life. And so hold on to your faith. Don't forget where you came from. How many of you remember what you were before you were saved? Let me ask you, are the same now that you were before you were saved? Because if so, there's a problem. I did something when I became pastor here. I think it's still in my office. To be honest, I'm not in there enough to remember. But I worked for the McDonald's 10 years. I mean, exactly 10 years. So I lost my scholarship to University of New Mexico because I was doing everything that my dad taught me not to do. And dad knew what I was doing. And he said he wasn't going to fund that project, that partying project that he knew I was participating in. So I got a job, and I got a job at McDonald's. They're at the craziest slash busiest store in the area across from University of New Mexico. And when I first started, I wasn't very good, but I started out cleaning toilets. I thought I was going to be making hamburgers, and they handed me a toilet brush and uh, gave me the process in which to scrub toilets. And then I moved up. I moved up really big. I got to be the guy to sweep and mop the floors and vacuum because they actually had carpet at a McDonald's. And I slowly worked my way up. And when I moved from, from Albuquerque to Canyon, Texas, I said, Lord, I'll do anything but work at McDonald's. There wasn't a single job. They hired me on the spot at McDonald's. And I said, Lord, that's not funny. But I worked there several years, and the owner that I worked for, him and his son had a fallen out, and so they divided up the, the McDonald's, and the dad wanted me, and so I had to go to the worst, meanest store in, in Amarillo, Texas. And I worked there all the, for, for several years. Moved up. 
a system manager, all those things. And so we were moving back to Hobbs. I was so happy that I'd never worked McDonald's again. And I had given that day my two weeks' notice to my bosses in Amarillo. Everybody had already come to Hobbs except me. I'm packing boxes, and Kenny Fackey, who I played tennis with in high school, who was a good friend of mine, called and said, your uncle said at church that you're coming to Hobbs, and I'm getting ready to start working for my dad to, to be an owner one of these days, and man, me and another person really need you to come down here and, uh, and train us and work for us at McDonald's. And I said, you know, I wouldn't come for, for a dime less than, and I gave a number that was an outrageous number. And they said, if you'll move down, we'll even pay for the move and give you that number. I said, Lord, what, have you, what are you doing to me? I already said that I was never going to stupid Hobbs anyhow. I was never going back. And now, really. So... The church had voted me in as pastor on January the 31st. I closed at some McDonald's, did the end of the month paperwork, helped the stores that I could help. And then on February 1st, the same exact date that I started in 19, uh, I think 89, February the 1st, I started my McDonald's career, and I ended my McDonald's career on February the 1st, 10 years to the day. I took a McDonald's clock that I won, and I put it over the doorway. And like I said, I think it's in there. And I put it there because I didn't want to forget where I had come from. I've had a lot of people tell me through the years when I've offered them jobs, I could get people jobs at McDonald's right now probably because the owner is my friend that I train. And when I talk to about them, of you need a job, I can help you get one with McDonald's. And they say, I would never work in a place like that. It always angers me a little bit because I was willing to work to wherever I had to so I could pay my way through school and I could put food on the table. And so those 10 years, I asked God for all 10 of those years. I thought I was going to do something in ministry. And you put me at McDonald's. Man, those 10 years at McDonald's is the reason I'm still in the ministry. Because I, I learned how to toughen up a little bit. And I learned how people are just in regular everyday life. It's a little different. And so as, as I think about that, I wanted to remember where I came from because I'm not better than anybody else. When I preach the gospel of Jesus, it's not because I'm better than them. It's because I want them to have the same thing I do, which is Jesus as Savior. And so that's, that's why I preach the gospel. That's why I spend time with people and praying and studying and just trying to help them. Because there was people along the way that helped me so much. I had, I had one McDonald's manager in Canyon, Texas. Talk about a godly man. I still remember him to this day. He would, it's like he knew when, when I didn't have much food on the table. It's like he knew. He'd say, hey, bring the family down. I'm going to cook steaks. Let me tell you, steaks from McDonald's is still steak, and it still tastes really good. I always appreciated him so much. He knew when I was discouraged, and he would encourage me. And so, don't forget where you came from. When you were saved, you probably were so excited, and you were ready to save the whole world. You know, as Theron progressed into international swimming, he began to win really significant races. I mean, there's not anybody I know that's ever won a world championship. 
but Theron has won several. And I remember I would always tell him on the phone when he talked about how, you know, he was talking to Mike, and it was Michael Phelps, you know, just, yeah, me and Mike was talking like it was just some other guy. I would always tell Theron, Theron, don't forget where you came from. Where did he come from? He came from a little church in Hobbs, New Mexico that is known for having a bunch of bad kids. It's known for a church that has people that have been hurt all over town and they come here because they feel welcome. It's known as a church that, that strives to be about God's word and not about tradition. And when I heard what Theron would do, he'd, he'd go to this little bitty church in a rough neighborhood in Colorado Springs. Him and Paula would go there. And he had left the place where people like Michael Phelps were staying. And they would go and give hot coffee to 15 and 16 year old homeless kids. And when they had youth nights, because they had pizza, Darren would bring all these homeless kids in. And I always thought, you know, I'm proud because he listened. He learned something because he's spending time with the highest of high, the richest of the richest, and he's spending time with those that are considered the lowest of the low. And Christians, that's who we should be. Don't forget about your faith. In verse 7 it says, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Now I'll tell you, I'm not going to explain that last sentence from the, from the pulpit, but it is a very, very, very serious thing that he said. The third thing this morning is to hold on to a strong finish. Hold on to a strong finish. Now, Darren can, can tell you that my next statement is extremely true. I always taught all of my athletes, whether they were 5-year-olds or 60-year-olds or in between, I always taught them that I want you to pace yourself in your race. And every race is different. But you better finish strong. If you're in the lead going on the last lap, you better win. And I mean, I wanted to do what they did in Australia. And this was real. People think I'm making this up. You can find this on YouTube. They had a team of little kids in Australia that they would jump in and once they got out about 15 meters, we're talking about a 25 meter, they get out about 15 meters, they dropped crocodiles, little ones, but still crocodiles, into the water. And they would go down that lane. i never seen anyone jump out of a pool. I mean, they were swimming, they jumped out of the water. And someone said, well, they taped the, the crocodile's mouth. What? I asked the athletic director if I could uh, do that, and he wanted to know what kind of drugs I was on. So, But I always said, you need to finish strong. In track, finishing strong, they teach you to lean in, right? I've seen Olympians lean in so far to win that as soon as they hit the tape, they rolled because they put everything into that. You can even jump. I've seen them run and jump and dive over the line. And in swimming, it's when your hand touches that, that touch pad on the wall. And when my kids, all my swimmers, if they got out-touched, oh, I was fuming. 
Because I, I was already thinking of how I was going to punish them at the next practice. Now, the Drake boys always made me insane. Because they knew they better finish strong. And so they just kind of hang out in the middle of the pack until the last laps. And they would always pull it out. And I'd say, are you trying to give me a heart attack? And they'd say, no, but I can't finish strong like you want me to if I went that hard for the whole race. Darren beat the Brazilian. Not to rub it in, Paula, but he beat the Brazilian in a 400-meter race, which is a long race, by 0 0.09 seconds. I thought the, the Brazilians were making that building rumble so loud, I figured that gave him the, the win. And everybody looks at the scoreboard to see who the win well, there's a problem. Every swimmer in the pool is blind. So you can hear him going, did you beat me or did I beat you? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who won. And everybody else is looking, and it was one of those finishes that was so close that the referees had to get together and make sure that it was there and beating. First thing I thought was, I'm so glad I taught him how to finish. Because even when he went to the Olympic Training Center, they'd say, man, you know how to finish a race. And he said, my dad would have killed me if I didn't. we got to finish the race strong. Some people's race lasts 20 years. Some last 100. Some last 80. I don't know how many years my race is going to last. But I need to be running the race so that when it is time for me to finish this race on this earth, that I finish strong. And then I continue to encourage people to finish their race as well. we got to finish the race. If you're tired, if you're beat up, if you're, you're tore down, that's okay. Because Jesus will reach down and pick you back up and get you back in the race. We serve a God who puts up with our bad behavior, our many repeated mistakes and sins, and he still loves us even through it. He wants to see us finishing strong. He wants to see us doing what we've been called to do. I had one year in high school, as I was coaching high school, that at the state championship, one of my kids got out-touched. They got second place, still broke the state record. Another one won, broke the state record. My first year to coach, I remember how hard my, my heartbeat was just racing. It was just racing. And I was saying, Lord, I hope they do well. But what I was saying is, Lord, I want them to use all their training. Lord, just help them be calm enough to use all their training. If all their training gets them fifth place, great. If all their training gets them last place, great. And if they didn't train, then they're not going to do good. That's the consequences of not training. I said, Lord, just give them a clear mind to use what they know. And he did. I had other kids, couldn't even make the finals. They'd get beat in the preliminaries. They were fast. And they'd tell me, Coach, I'm sorry. I was just laying back to save it for the finals. Well, you didn't make the finals because... You laid back. You weren't thinking. I think through my lifetime, all the people that I have been in contact with, and those people that I've lifted up Jesus to them, and those people that I've pushed them away from Jesus, because I've done both, and I'm not proud of pushing people away from Christ, but I've done that. Through the things I've said, the way I've lived through the years, and I would tell you, 
We need to encourage one another. You may not even know what's going on in someone's life this morning that's sitting right in this room or is listening on Facebook. You may not know, but you can tell something's wrong, right? Most of us have begun to, to understand each other enough that they know something's wrong. They'll say to me, hey, pastor, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. All right, come on, pastor, you know better. There's something wrong. Something's going on. And I can tell that with you. Why? Because I get to know you, and I care what happens in your life. It matters to me. Our last couple of weeks, we got folks in our church, which means me too. Man, we've been put through it bad. Been put really through some bad things. Stay in the race, okay? Stay in the race. Don't quit. Don't give up. I know there's been moments that you've said, I'm just, I, I'm done. I'm done, Lord. I'm done. I'm just going to go back and do what I used to do. I know you had those moments. I have them too. Stay in the race. Probably the most touching thing I ever saw at a swim meet was in the 500 yards, which is the longest high school race. They were swimming. And obviously this, this one swimmer was injured. I don't know if something happened during the race, but everybody was done with the race and out of the water. And this kid had another go down and come back, an entire lap left. And I felt really bad for the kid. I mean, all the coaches were going, man, I hate when this happens. I just hope the kid keeps finishing. And two Hobbs High School swimmers, this wasn't at our pool either, two Hobbs High School swimmers, when the kid touched the wall, jumped in and swam extra lap so that that kid had someone to swim with him. I never heard a roar and a cheer like that at a, at a swim meet as we did that day. And I had all these coaches going, man, that's so awesome that you taught them to do that. And I said, never even thought that would happen. I never taught them to do that. They just did it. The newspaper said, why in the world would you swim an extra lap? And they said, we just wanted to encourage them. Because we've been the person that gets lapped and it, it feels awful. And you don't want to finish, but, you know, coach isn't going to let us quit. We just didn't want him to finish by himself. So it was worth a little extra lap for us to jump in and to encourage him. And there's some of us in here that things are going pretty well. And maybe you need to put in an extra lap to encourage those that are struggling. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can stand here this morning. Lord, that we can hear your word. Lord, I pray that we, we run a good race, that we finish strong. Lord, that we understand that no one knows where that finish line is for us. But Lord, that we would be willing to encourage others to go the extra mile, Lord, to help them. Lord, that we would, we would go with new Christians and help them learn how to run the race. Lord, that we would just be people who lift you up. And Lord, for those that are listening today that are ready to give up, Lord, I just pray that you'd whisper in their ear right now that it's going to be okay that you've already paid their price. One of these days, they're going to spend all of eternity with you in heaven. But until then, Lord, that they keep running. They keep in the race. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me. This is our time that you can come. You can come to the altar.